The teachings of Rabbi Ephraim Sprecher, Dean of Students at Diaspora Yeshiva on Mount Zion, Jerusalem. This week is the first of the Aftaris, of the, the three Aftaris that we read right before um, Tisha B'Av. The three Aftaris of tragedy and Churban. Now, Yermio lived in Anatot, which is very close to me because it's uh, next to Pisgat Zev, I'm not joking. So Yermio was a neighbor of mine in Anatot, the land of Benyamin. And he was the uh, prophet of the Churban the prophet of doom, but he's also the prophet of hope. We'll see soon. But he suffered terribly. This great prophet of Hashem suffered terribly. Why would God make his great prophet suffer so much? But let's think. Hashem tells him in the Haftorah, I will send you. You are going to be my shliach. God says, you are my shliach, Yermio. And we know a person's agent is like what? Himself. The Jews are going through great suffering over here. So God makes his agent suffer because God suffers along with his people. Yiddish Reb Chanoch, it's a verse in Psalm 91. <laughs> I am with him who is him. Every Jew that suffers and all of his suffering. To, to make that point, to demonstrate that point, God makes his agent, Yermio, suffer greatly. A person's agent like himself to prove that when we suffer, a Kurdish Baruch Hu suffers along with us. So what does God make us suffer? Yeah. Tough love. When God makes us suffer, it's not to punish us. It's called tough love. Sometimes a parent has to, uh, has to administer tough love. But the point is that when we suffer, God suffers along with us, Psalm 91. And to prove that point, God makes a point of saying to a Yemio, Eshlachacho, I will make you my shliach. And a person's shliach is like himself. So when Yemio suffering is actually what? God suffering. Isn't that incredible? And during the tragedy, the Korban, the Holocaust, the Holocaust, the Holocaust, God suffers along with us. So the terrible uh, punishments being described over here for our terrible sins. So the prophet of doom, but inexplicably, at the end of the prophecy, he's the prophet of hope. He says, go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem. God says, I remember the chesed that you Jews displayed for me, God says, when you were my young kala. Chesed norayich. We did chesed for God. Say what? Know, how can I do a chesed for God? But that's what God says to Yermio. After all the punishments and all the suffering, God says, I'll never forget the chesed that you Jews demonstrated when you were my young loving bride. Well, you follow me in the Midbar, in the land that what? There was nothing there. We didn't say, where are you taking us, God? There's no Motel 6, there's no Howard Johnson's. We said, we'll follow you anywhere. So God says, I'll never forget that. But how can we do chesed for God? Isn't that an incredible idea? Huh? By trusting Hashem and loving Him unconditionally, God says that's a chesed that you Jews are doing for me. That's a pretty incredible idea that little old me can do a chesed for Kurdish Baruch Hu. So after all of the tragedies and the suffering, God says, I'll never forget the lovey-dovey times, and we'll be lovey-dovey times again. My Rebbe Rapam said, based on this, this idea that God and the Jewish people, God is the Chatan and the Jewish people are the Kala, and all marriages have their ups and down. It can't be any other way because, I'm trying to remember, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. I remember that. So there has to be this constant friction and quarrel. And that's why Rav Savechik says, therefore, the chosen breaks the glass under the chuppah because it's the last time he'll get a chance to put his foot down. No, because, what? Not that. No, but the re he said the reason is to demonstrate that even though everything is lovey-dovey now, there will be broken glasses. There has to be. 
but since we love each other unconditionally, therefore we love each other despite the broken glasses. And therefore Moshe had to break the tablets. At our wedding, Moshe broke the tablets. The tablets was the ksuba, he broke the tablets. There has to be, it can't be another way. In every loving marriage there has to be broken tablets or broken glasses. But, since we love each other, we focus on what? On the good times. So therefore, Rapam Zatzali said that God is taking out his wedding albums. Even though we have quarrels and we upset him and he has to show us tough love, God takes out the wedding album and he tells uh, Yermio, I remember the good times, the lovey-dovey times, and we can have that again. So therefore, my, my Rebbe said it's important to have a wedding album. We're talking about 35 years ago. 30 years ago, he said it's important to have a wedding album. Today, I don't think I have it. It's important to have a wedding album because when you have a quarrel, which you have to have, you take out, like Hashem took out the wedding album and he demonstrated what, let's focus on the good times. Remember how happy we were? We can be that way again. You accent the positive and you don't focus on the negative. And God, despite all of the tsaurus we gave him in the midbar, God focuses what? On the chesed narayach, when we were young kala, what about the chet maraglam, the chet egel, and, and the, the korach mutiny? God focuses on the loving chesed we showed him when we were his young kala. So this is a message for couples that quarrel, that even though there has to be arguments, but you focus and concentrate on what? On the good. So this is good advice for a marriage counselors, right? You wouldn't let him look at the, the you would as a marriage counselor, and he uses this half Torah. Focus on the good times, not on the bad times. There has to be bad times, it's only normal, but you zero in on all the chesed that we do for each other. And the Kurdish Baruch is the one that want, that shows us the, the example. Now the Pasha, Pasha's Matot. Rosh Hamatot, this week we read Rosh Hamatot, the uh, laws of keeping your word, not to desecrate your word, Someone who breaks his vow transgresses a negative and a positive. So Moshe speaks to the head of the tribes and tells them, be careful to keep your word. Only the head of the tribes have to keep their word? Every person has to what? Keep their, keep their word. word. So why does Moshe summon the head of the tribes? So Rashi said that really he taught this to the entire Jewish people, like every other mitzvah, but to show, to show covet for the leaders. So why pick this mitzvah to show them COVID? Pick another mitzvah. Chola COVID on To teach them first the laws of what? Of keeping your word. And then he repeated it to what? To the Am Yisrael. But all the mitzvahs he repeated to the Am Yisrael. So you want to show COVID to the Nesim. Why aren't you the order the laws of Shabbos? The laws of Kashrut? Why dafke by the laws of vows? Do you want to show COVID to the leaders? To teach them first the laws of what? Of keeping your word. If you analyze the question very carefully, the answer is where? Leaders have to keep their word. Read my lips. Who said that? No more taxes. Or read my lips. The Rosh Matois. The leaders, the political leaders, they have to keep their promises and their vows. If they ain't going to do it, who will? So first Moshe said to the Rosh Hamatot, guys, keep your word. Your word is your bond, because you are the role model. Your tribesmen are looking at you. If you don't keep your words, why should they? So that's why the Pasha of vows and keeping your word is first said to the Rosh Mato. They have to be what? The role models. My word is my bond. Because if the leaders are not going to do it, why should the, the, the people do it? Very interesting. Rosh Hamatot. The Bashem Tov has an amazing explanation. You just came to hear this. Don't leave, but this is a game changer. Bashem Rosh Hamatot. God spoke to Moshe, and Moshe told the Rosh Hamatot, this is the thing that God commanded. The word Rosh means what? Head, chief, right? The word Matot is also the word Lamata. What does Lamata mean? Down. down. Says the Holy Vashemta, whether you're having a Rosh day, what does that mean? A good day. A good day. On top of it, oh, has to show me having a down day. Zeha Dava Shetziva Hashem. Mm -hmm. You keep me getting this? Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes we have a Rosh day, we're on top. But Sometimes Nebuch, Leilenu, we have Lamata day. A down day, a bad hair day. Don't be upset. This is a thing that God commanded. What, what did God command? What kind of day you're going to have? A Rosh day? A Chas V'Sholem, a Lamata day. What a beautiful formula for living. Avi, you getting this? We all have Rosh days and we all have what? Down days. But why are you getting upset? This is the th matter that God commanded. What did he command? What type of day you're going to have? A Rosh day or Lamata day? An amazing idea from the Vashem Tov. Wow. Rosh Hamatot, the chiefs of the tribes. Mate means a tribe. Mate also means a staff. So why is it the same word? We know in Hebrew there are different meanings to the same word. They have to be what? Connected. Connected. Why is the chief of the tribes called Rosh Hamatot? Because the chief of the tribes would carry a staff. The same word for this week's this week's That's it, matot. Tribes, but tribe also means mate. Mate means a staff. What is the connection between tribe and the tribal chiefs would carry what? A staff. To uh, demonstrate that they are what? The leaders. Right? Remember Cochise, he would carry a staff full of feathers. Isn't it the same word for airplane on too? No, matos. That's a different spelling. Matos, but that's a different spelling. That's for a samach. <laughs> so what's the connection between a staff and a chief of the tribe that he would carry a staff? You ever go to a symphony orchestra? Yeah. A lot of people playing in the orchestra, right? Everyone has their part to play. But if you don't have a maestro waving the staff, every one of us is playing a unique role in the symphony called creation. But without the conductor waving the staff, we all get confused. Rosha Hamatot, it's the chief of the tribes, the leader, he has to wield the baton. Is that called the baton? Yes. Zubin Mater, the baton? So therefore, the head of the tribe is called Rosh HaMatot, every person in the tribe. Every person has the unique role to play in the symphony that we call the creation. But it's up to the leader to direct us with his mate, that's his baton. But without the, 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 the conductor waving his mate, it all sounds like noise, right? So the chief of the tribe, the leaders, they have to be our conductors. They have to direct us, and that's symbolized by what? The mate. Mate means a staff, a baton. It's pretty incredible, isn't that an amazing idea? What? Moshe also All of them, not just Moshe. Every tribe had their mate. Remember in Pasha's Korach, God says, let the tribal chiefs each deposit their mate where? In the Mishkan. And Aaron's mate grew flowers and what? And almonds. So why do we need 12 different tribes for? Why? Each tribe had their own prince. Each tribe had their own flag. Each tribe had their own color. Each tribe had their own nusach. What do you need that for? Nusach, that's right. The Ariya Kodesh says every tribe had their own nusach. Some were Swardi, some were Ashkenazi. Each one has their own month too. Why, why 12 different tribes? Who sang that? Different strokes for different folks? Hmm? We need the black cats and the white shirts. We need the Kippah Saruga and the Shrimals and the Hawaiian shirts. Unity, but not uniformity. Unity, not uniformity, says the Ramban. The ways of the Torah are sweet and pleasant. No one can say my way or the highway. Right? No one has a monopoly on Hashem. There are many ways to reach Hashem. 
And that symbolized, says Nachmanides, by the 12 different tribes, each one with a unique flag, a unique color, and a separate Choshen, in the Choshen Mishpat was separate, uh, a different jewel representing unity, but not, but not uniformity. That's very important in Judaism. Very important, right? What? Right? Now, right after the Pasha of Vows, the Torah tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu was commanded by God to take revenge against Midian because they were responsible for the death of 24,000 Jews. Why is the Pasha of Nedorim next to the Pasha of War? When the two Pashas in the Torah are next door, there has to be a connection. The Torah tells us the Pasha of Vows next to the Pasha of Going to War. What's the connection? Why is it next door? So the Talmud says, here you learn a person should normally not make vows. Because it's very easy to forget and break your word is a terrible sin. Right. Your word is your bond. But in wartime, it's permitted to make vows. When a person is in and danger, like a wartime, then it's praiseworthy to make a vow. Hashem, if you get me out of here, I vow to what? To learn this amount, to give this amount of tzedakah. So in wartime, it's praiseworthy to make a vow, other times not. Therefore, the Pasha of vows is next door, Avi, to the Pasha of what? Of war in the Torah. So the Torah says to Moshe, you take revenge against the Midianites. Draft an army. And God says, take revenge for spilled Jewish blood. But Moshe reports it to the IDF, he says, take revenge for God. So Rashi wonders, why does Moshe change God's instruction? God says, take revenge for spilled Jewish blood. And Moses says, no, take revenge for God. So Rashi said, Moshe is not changing God's instruction. Anyone that stands up and fights Israel is like he stands up and he fights God. It's one and the same. Revenge for Israel and revenge for God is what? The same thing. This is incredible. If you, I wish you had a, the books, you know, the books. It says, Elef Lamate, Elef Lamate. You should draft a thousand for a tribe, a thousand for a tribe to go out to war. How many was there? The Torah says there were 12,000. Each tribe, even Shevet Levi, contributed what? A thousand. So how come it's written Elef Lamate, Elef Lamate twice? A thousand for a tribe and a thousand for a tribe. Seems to be redundant. There's only a thousand per tribe, and the Torah sums up. They sent out 12,000. Why is it repeated Elef Lamate, Elef Lamate? So the Sifri says something amazing. For each thousand soldiers that were fighting, there was another thousand sitting in the yeshiva and saying till him and learning just for them. And making Mishaberach for them. So according to the Sifri, making Mishaberach for the Chayalim is a mitzvah in the Torah. Elef Lamate is an extra word, Elef Lamate. For every soldier fighting in the field, you had like a pen pal, you had one, one guy sitting in the yeshiva studying exclusively for what? For that chayal in the foxhole. So call it Sifri, make a mishabera for chayalim, Avi is what? Mitzvah and Torah. I think the Sifri were Haredi, I think. Pretty incredible. Otherwise, it's redundant. Elef lamate, elef lamate. Elef lamate, elef lamate. Pretty incredible. So God says, for each chayal, there has to be another guy sitting in the coil. Zavling make me for that chayal. So you see, it's a mitzvah in the Torah to be mispalo for the chayalim. So I don't know how the guys that certain shuls don't do it. I can't understand that. They don't do it. So can you can you tell them this puzzle, Mikimia? They don't do it. So how do they learn this puzzle? Elif lamate. I don't understand. They say, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's made up, right? Unfortunately. The, gro the Nasi does, sure. Of course. So God says, Moshe, you take revenge against the Midianites. Moshe doesn't do it. He sends Pinchas in his place. So the Rav asked the question, but God commanded Moshe to do it. Why is he handing off the task to a, a subordinate? So Rav Slavichik says, Remember 40 years ago? This is 40 years after the, after the Exodus. Right? 40 years ago. Or more than 40. Was How many years ago? 
But Moshe killed the Mitzri. He was a fugitive. Remember the fugitive, Avi? Remember the fugitive? The KGB was looking for him. Who gave him protection? Midian. If it wasn't for the king of Midian, for the Midianites, Yisrael could never take him in. He would be nabbed by the KGB and be strung up. So even though God says you take revenge against Midian, he could not do it. Because he owed Midian. The Korosatov said Rav Salavechik, the Korosatov, the Recheret comes before the Torah. They protected him. Otherwise, Yisrael couldn't take him in. And therefore, he owed them a tremendous debt of gratitude. And therefore, he himself could not go to war, even though God said, what? Go to war. Incredible God idea. Knew, God knew that. Why did he order ah, that? this is only a test. God was testing him. Mm, good, you would ask a good question. So why did God tell him? Hmm? To test him. To test him. Pretty amazing, huh? And he passed the test. He passed the test. Pretty interesting, right? So they go to war and they kill out all the, the Midianites, except they bring back what? The women, the women captives, they bring back. So Moshe's upset with them. He says, why did you allow these harlots to live? They are the ones through Bilaam's evil counsel, they are the ones that seduced the men of Israel and brought us the death of 24,000 Jews. What right do you have to leave these women alive? This was Bilaam's advice. The question is, you know, why doesn't the Torah tell us that in Pasha's uh, Balak? There it says that the Jews sinned with the wild Moabite Midianite women. It doesn't say that Bilaam instigated them. What is a Torah delay, Leah? <coughs> Only now. In Bamidbor, M Matos, Moshe says, Bilaam is the one that gave this evil counsel that the girls should what? Seduce the men. Why doesn't the Torah tell us when it actually happened back in Pasha's Balak? <coughs> and why should I care? Leah, why should I care? You hear the question? The Torah is GPS. She came just to hear this. Now I hear this. Baby, she came at a good time. Again, you hear my question? When the incident happened and the, these harlots seduced the Jewish men, it doesn't say it was Bilaam's advice. It just found they were seduced. Why does the Torah wait until now when Moshe says, don't you know it was Bilaam's advice by Midbar 31, Postal 16, Yehuda, Bilaam's advice to ruin us by having these girls prostitute themselves and force us into a harlotry and our void Zara. Why does the Torah not tell us when it actually happened? Rabbeinish, why wait until now? You hear my question? And why should I care? You ready? <coughs> the devil made me do it. Remember the Mendes brothers, they shotgun their parents. They had a bad upbringing. The parents didn't give them Twinkies. Everyone has an excuse. So even though Bilaam gave this evil counsel, it's not reported when it happens. Why? You have free wills. So he gave the advice. Don't take it. Don't take it. Who said you have to fall for their wiles? You hear the message? Yes, it was Bilaam's evil counsel to have these girls seduce the men. So what? Why did you listen? You have a brain of your own. You know what's moral and what's immoral. You're going to blame it on Bilaam? So while it happened, the Torah is silent. You got to take the rap. Later on, we have to know that it was Bilaam's advice and he'll be punished for it. But that doesn't take me off the hook. I have the moral ability to choose what's right and wrong and I can't blame Bilaam, I can't blame my parents, I can't blame the school system. What a powerful message, Yehuda. Why the Torah is silent when the incident happens and only reveals it was Bilaam's advice much later on. Amazing idea, we still have free choice. Right? I mean, today it's a blame game. Pass the buck, he made me do it, the society made me do it, right? No, 
You are a person, you stand on your own two feet and you have to live with your decisions. Can I have a question? Yes. Okay. So, when, when Aaron tells Mo, I mean, when Aaron tells Moshe, Moshe comes down and breaks the glucose and he asks Aaron what happened. And right. He said, they made me do it. What am I supposed to do? Where were you so long? Right? <coughs> but he's forgiven. He's forgiven. Aaron, One minute. Especially, you know, he lost two sons, didn't he? Yes. But, but, He's, but, he but did tshuva, but he suffered a terrible punishment. He lost two sons. But, okay, but Rashi thing, said that was because of the, of the Egev. But the thing he is, did a terrible mistake, but he did tshuva for it. Okay, but his son, he shouldn't have passed the buck, but he did. But, his but son, the, the, all the heroes of the Tanakh, they're not robots, they're all human. But his sons, with all due respect, of course it's Mr. Kainu Midak, it should never happen to anyone. But, they brought a Zara. They are responsible for what they Well, did. now you're opening up a whole discussion. Yes. Fine. Yes. Okay. Very good. Yes. Yes. And so, and One they minute. Results, and they were Rashi tells us that, you're asking very good. So we go off the subject. Fine. Great question. Rashi says that all four sons were involved with building the golden calf. The decree of death was on Aaron and all his four sons, and all his four sons. Moshe was mispalel, he was able to save Eloza via Tamar, even though they were also involved. So why was he not successful in order of So Rashi explains, they were an overdraft. Moshe was able to save Eloza via Tamar, even though they were also involved with the sin of the golden calf. But they only had that one sin. Not of Yavil, besides the sin of building, helping the father build the Egel, they also had the sin of drinking wine, bringing the Zara. How do you say overdraft in English? Overdraft. They were overdraft, right? So therefore, so their account was overdrawn. And therefore, Moshe's prayer could not save them, but did save Aaron and Loza via Tamar. Because Aaron and Elizabeth are talking about, they only had that one sin of the Egel. Not of you had the Egel sin, but they also had the additional sins of Eish Zara, drinking wine, not getting married, like Yehuda says. But they were all involved in it. It was a terrible sin, but everybody sins. The message of the Torah is that everybody sins. There are no perfect people. Right? Like, like some other religions where they walk, they're perfect. Judaism tells it like it is. Right? right? We are human, and to be human means to fail. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And when did God appoint Aaron to be the high priest? <laughs> After he sinned with the eagles, mind-boggling. Right? So he appointed him to be the high priest, despite that he worshipped the eagle, or perhaps because, because he did tshuva. When a person does tshuva, he can turn a sin into what? A win. A win. So that's the message why the Torah tells us that. But everybody sins, everybody makes some mistakes. And what do you do afterwards? Right? Nochon? So anyway, the Torah here goes on. And uh, over here, the Torah teaches us about Marit Ayin. Where is the concept of Marit Ayin here in, in the Torah? The Bnei God and the Bnei Ruvain, they want to stay by Eva Hayardain, right? It's amazing how the Parsh of the week, Benish, I couldn't make this up, how the Parsh of the week always speaks to what? Current events. Now, but this week, a mother forgot her baby in, in the car. Six month old baby and the baby died. Her cell phone she did not forget, but never she forgot the baby. I'm not making this up. Oh, yeah, yeah. This week, <coughs> it was in the Jerusalem Post on Monday. Yeah. Big headline. Yeah. Where do you find that in the Pasha of the week? It's incredible where a person is more concerned with his smartphone than with his own child. Mamish this week, the B'nai God, the B'nai Ruvain, they say to Moshe Rabbeinu, what do they say to him? We are going to build shelters for our possessions, for our cattle, our possessions, and then we will build shelters for our children. 
says Rashi, hello, they had more concern for their cell phone. I'm not making this as Rashi. You look it up, Amidbar 32, 16, they had more concern for their cell phones and possession more than their children. Because they put their possessions, they mentioned before what, their children. Moshe said, are you guys nuts? First, take care of your children. Don't leave the kid in the car. Leave the dumb phone in the car, but not your child. David, Rashi, how did Rashi know this a thousand years ago? I said, the cell phone she took with her. That she didn't forget, but never the baby she forgot and he suffocated. Rashi, Rashi, she's a caregiver. The baby, are you getting this? She must come for B'nai God, Nebuch. She must come from the children of God. It was her own kid, though. She runs a, a uh, daycare center. So she left the baby in the car and she went shopping with her cell phone. And she came back, the kid Nebuch was dead. But it's amazing. The child or safety organization said not to forget your child in the car, put your dumb phone near your baby. Because your dumb phone you won't forget. But here she took her phone and forgot the baby. It's incredible. Anyway, you learn out Maris Ayin from here, from the Torah. <coughs> the B'nai God and B'nai Ruvain, they want to make the Eber Hayardain, the East Bank, even though there's no banks there. They don't want to go across to, to the West Bank. So they say, Moshe Rabbeinu, we're going to leave our families behind and we will go fight in the vanguard to conquer Eretz Israel. So Moshe Rabbeinu says to them, if you keep your word, then you will be clean in the eyes of God and the eyes of Israel. By Midbar 32, Apostle 22. If you keep your word, again, it's, it's Pasha of the week. We know you that at the end of the Pasha, the beginning of the Pasha, you have to have what? The beginning of the Pasha says, keep your vow. Don't desecrate your word. In the end of Pasha, Moshe's warning the B'nai God, B'nai Ruvain, you made a vow that you're going to fight in the vanguard. Make sure you keep it, because Moshe will be dead already. So you see how the Pasha connects, Nelly Sheva. You make, your word is your bond. The B'nai God, B'nai Ruvain, they make a vow that they will keep their word, that they will lead the IDF troops in the Dudavani Brigade before they go back, what? To Eva Yarde. Right? So you keep, your, keep your word. And he said, if you keep your word, what? Moshe made sure that they would keep their word. But he was dead already. By putting Manasseh in with them. Okay, but Moshe would be dead. But keep your word. He says, if you keep your word, you will be clean and innocent in the eyes of God and the eyes of Israel. So the question is, the Talmud asked, if God knows I'm innocent, Hanoch, why does Israel have to know? You hear the question? Be clean and innocent in the eyes of God and the eyes of Israel. So what do you have to add? That if God knows I'm innocent, then what, is, what do I care what Israel it thinks? It also doesn't look good if you do things bad. Enough. So from here the Talmud learns out Morris T. Ion. Remember Morris T. Ion? Yes. Morris Ion. Right, Mount Utah. Yeah. Ion. What's Morris Ion? That even though God knows, if you're going into McDonald's, you're not going in what? To buy a cheeseburger, you're going to buy in a Coke. So God knows, but people might think that you're going to buy a cheeseburger. Right, so you shouldn't do it. Even though God knows I'm not buying a cheeseburger, I'm buying what? A Coke. And that's okay. But people say, no, he's buying a cheeseburger too. So therefore you can't go to McDonald's. Morris Ion. But God knows I'm innocent. Not enough. For success, Israel has no innocent. Now, the question that Moshe Feinstein's at all asked, I have to go to the bathroom. And the only bathroom is a tray for a restaurant. Hmm? What did you say? I have to go to bed to the bathroom. And the only bathroom around, is like New York State Thruway, the only bathroom around is what? A tray for a restaurant at McDonald's. So what's the question? Can you go in or not? So there, you go in, because why? What's it called? Kovet It's not emergency. Kovet is doicha. Judaism, there's values, there's values constantly. Marisayin is a value, but Kovet is a greater value. How do you say English, Kovet 
dignity of the human being. You are making your pants. It's not nice. So Ramosha rules that covet habriyos trumps marasayan. You just layer. You have to wait. You see, the rabbis made up marasayan and they made up covet habriyos. Covet habriyos is a greater value than what? Than marasayan. So in such a case, you would what? Go into McDonald's to use the bathroom and get a Coke, but not a cheeseburger. <laughs> because the dignity of a human being takes what? Precedent. Takes precedence. Kovet habriot. You come out to make a lot of Ashe Yotzar. Is anybody watching? Ashe Yotzar. Es Adam. Bechachma. Look, no cheeseburgers. All right. Interesting, right? Yes? Why? Everything, every question is important. Go ahead. Yeah. You know when bakos came out, when things that were kosher? Okay, so now you're... Okay, good. And, and there was, I wouldn't need yeah. One second. Rav Moshe Feinstein Natal has a whole tshuva. When power of a milk first came out. Yeah. I remember as a kid. Power of a milk first came out. So at a wedding, when you had a nice meat meal, they would bring out the, the power of milk from your coffee. Yeah. So he said, when it first came out, you had to put the yeah. containers yeah. on the table. <laughs> ah, milk after meat. So he ruled that you have to put the container of the power of a coffee on the table. Later on, he said, when it became what? Popular, you didn't need it anymore. Because then people already understood that what? That there is power of milk. When it first came out, there was more a sign problem. <laughs> then they preached to what? Mm -hmm. you, the, uh, right. So later on, Ramosha ruled, no, since everybody knows that's power of milk, you can keep the container in the refrigerator. But the waiters, I remember when I was a kid, the waiters would bring out the container, leave it on the table. In the fancy restaurants, they, they had engraved on the, on the silver thing, parva. You know, parva, parva, right, right. But one thing, blood of a fish is permitted. You're allowed to drink fish blood. Huh? My modern rules that if you're drinking fish blood, you have to have the fish head on the table. Fish blood looks like animal blood. It looks like the same. Well, if you're drinking blood, right? Then make sure that, that you have what? A fish head on the table. Because people shouldn't what? Accuse you of what? Of, uh, of having meat? Uh, animal blood, right? Sounds fishy to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Pretty amazing over here, right? So they make a whole speech. It's amazing. They make a speech. They say, we will go in the vanguard for the Jewish people and we will be victorious. They keep saying that. Moshe Rabbeinu gives them Musar. He says, Lifnei Hashem. Lifnei Hashem. What do you mean we are going to win the war? Hashem. Hashem. So they get the message. After he keeps rebuking them, they say, Anachnu Nechaletz, Anachnu, Anachnu. We're going to win the war. We're going to win the war. Moshe says, No. Lifnei Hashem la Melchama. Lifnei Hashem la Melchama. Over and over again he says it. They're quick learners. Then they say, We will go, Lifnei Hashem la Melchama. Kashia Doni Dover. They accept the rebuke. And they say, yes, we're not going to win the war. Lifnei Hashem la Mochama. Kasher Adoni Dover. As you spoke. We accept your Musa. Pretty interesting, right? They learned, they learned their lesson. They learned their lesson, right? So here Moshe rebukes them. Moshe rebukes them. But they accept the rebuke. And later on, Moshe Rabbeinu praises them. Here he really rebukes them. You guys want to chicken out. Your brothers are going to war. And what? And you are going to stay remind right here. Right? He really rebukes them. But later on in Pasha Zoy Sabracha, he praises them. Why does the rebuke turn into praise? Because they did Shuva. They did Shuva. First they said, we will win the war. But then they say, Hashem will win the war. When a person does Shuva, he turns that sin into a win. So therefore, the rebuke that Moshe has over here in Zoy Sabracha, he what? He praises these same people, B'nai God and the B'nai Ruvain. So everybody makes mistakes. Do you learn from your mistakes? Do you grow from your mistakes? Or what? 
keep making the same mistakes over and over again, right? Nochon? <laughs> this past is always read around Shivasa Betamuz. Shivasa Betamuz, Zechariah says, will become a Yantav. Now it's a fast day. When Mashiach comes, Tishabav and Shivasa Betamuz will become a Yantav. We'll do Tshuva. So by doing Tshuva, we turn the tragedy into what? Into joy. The Koyach Tshuva. That a person can turn around, turn around, turn the tragedy into joy if he does a genuine tshuva. Like the B'nai Godim and Ruven did over here. They did tshuva. So they go to war. They go to war. And the captains of the IDF repeat, the Midianites were a super powerful nation. We only had 12,000 soldiers in the IDF. They come back and tell Moshe, a miracle, not one person is missing, not one person wounded, not one person yeah. dead. Wow. Yeah. Midbar 32, verse 49, against such a powerful foe, <laughs> overwhelming odds, 12,000 IDF, like the Six Day War. Now they had casualties over here. But when Yifkad men wish, they took a census, the captain said, nobody's missing, no MIAs. Nobody killed and nobody even wounded. They're nervous about that. They say they need a kapara. You know why they're so nervous? Why the captains of the IDF nervous? They said we need a kapara al nafshaseni Yehuda. We need a kapara. Why you know God did a tremendous miracle for you? None of your soldiers are missing, not wounded or killed. Why are the captains of the IDF called? Why they're so nervous? They say we need a kapara al nafshaseni. We need a kapara. Why? The Gemara Brachas tells us when a great miracle happens to you, your schusim go down a lot. I think it's called a withdrawal. You made a huge withdrawal from your ATM in the sky. You yeah. Such a tremendous miracle, the captains of the IDF were very nervous. Because we made a huge withdrawal from our ATM in Olam Haba. When we get there, we'll say, God will say, you used up all your schusim. I did a great miracle for you. Therefore, they had a right to be nervous. I mean nervous. Hmm? Says the Marshal, Masech the Brochus. How do you take care of the problem? How? By giving tzedakah and tefillah. So therefore, they wanted to give the tzedakah from the booty. They wanted to give it to what? To the Mishkan. By giving tzedakah and being mitpalel, then your account goes what? Back up again. Okay. We're not learning history. We need to say what the IDF commander said to Moses 3,330 years ago. Why they're nervous, need a kapara. This is to teach. Person has a miracle done for him. Yeah. His chusim are what? Depleted. So the marshal says, these captains of the IDF, they showed us the way. Give tzedakah and be mitpalel and your chusim are what? Come back again. So it's not stories, Rachmiel. It's not stories, it's what? It's GPS, God's personal system. Otherwise, why do I care what they said to Moses, how nervous they were, we need a kapara. Masha says, no, they're teaching us. So therefore, a person should give tzedakah and be mitpalel. And then, even though he has great miracles, don't we have miracles every day happening to us? Yes. So how do we guarantee that our schusim are not our merits are not depleted. What's the guarantee? Giving tzedakah and being with palel. That's insurance policy. That after 120, all of our merits will what? Be there. Be there or be square. Yeah. So that's what you learn from what? From, uh, from these stories over here, the Mechama. Now Moshe Rabbeinu here, forgets the halacha of, of uh, uh, Kalim. You get vessels from a non-Jew that the non-Jew Jew used, you have to what? Kasher them. Moshe forgot the law because he became angry. He became angry, Rashi says, at the IDF commanders for allowing the women to live. So he became angry, he forgot the halacha. So even a great man like Moses, if you become angry, you lose it. You lose it. Isn't that amazing? You lose it. So, 
the kashering the kalim. It's an amazing Rashi over here. How do you kasher kalim? Anything that went into the fire, you have to kasher with fire. Right? Right. Any, if you use the uh, non, the, the dish was used through fire, non kosher, then you have to kasher it with fire. So Rashi says the way the, the utensil was used, that's the way you have to what? Kasher it. Rav Cook has an amazing idea on this. We don't, I don't know, I don't kasher kalim, do you? So what's the message for me that I don't kasher kalim, Yuda? What's the message? Huh? Says Rav Cook. This applies to everything in life. This concept of how to clean our souls. We need to look at the way we sinned to figure out how to rectify our sins. The tikkun comes from the chet. The way you sin is the way you win. Yir Rav Kuk is saying a deeper message of Kashrin Kalim. The way the Kali was used for what? For non-kosher purposes? Now you have to use the Kali for what? For kosher purposes. Rav Kuk said this is a message in life. We sinned the way we sin is the way we do the tikkun. The tikkun comes from the chet. So every person sins. So the way he sinned, now he has to use that what? To transform that sin into a win. Everybody sins. And therefore we have to make a golden mishkan. We sin with gold. God doesn't need a golden mishkan with golden lovebirds in the Holy of Holies. God needs golden statues in the Holy of Holies. We made a golden calf. God says, you like golden statues so much? Do it my way. Now make a golden statue in the Holy of Holies. So this is the idea. The way a person sin is the way he has to do the tikkun. And this is the idea of kashering. We have to kasher our own keli, our godly soul. To look at the way our soul sins, said Rav Kook, to figure out how to rectify our sin, to purify our soul the way we contaminated our soul. And this is a deeper message here of what? Of kashering of kashering uh, a kalim, right? On Sunday we have a class, why God made himself homeless. God's been homeless for 1950 years. The mission, the base amygdala was God's home. So if we sin, why did God have to destroy his house? For more of Rabbi Sprecher's teachings, visit rabbisprecher.com.